Hello everyone, this is James Johnson and I'm back with another review video. So in this episode we're going to be looking at Paradox Development Studios uh, Brainchild Game Crusader Kings 2. So Paradox is responsible for for a very specific um, grand strategy genre of games. Uh, maybe best known would be Stellaris. It's probably the most mainstream and sci-fi oriented. But there's also Hearts of Iron 4, Europa Universalis 4, Victoria 2, and Crusader Kings 2. And far away my favorite is Crusader Kings 2. I have literally, uh, what is it, like something like 3,000 hours in Crusader Kings 2, and I just can't get enough of this game. So here we are uh, in a current game that I have going. Uh, I am just, uh, I'm the Duke of Normandy. Well. That was a recent acquisition, uh, and I uh, controlled the, the counties of these counties here in the lighter purple. So Martain, Evero, uh, Rowan, Vexen, Amiens, and Eu. But this isn't a let's play, right? This is a review. What is Crusader Kings 2? Well, it's grand strategy. Um, but that's not really a very good uh, description of Crusader Kings 2. To me, Crusader Kings 2 is, well, it's transcended the grand strategy genre, if you will. It's actually the grand strategy roleplay genre is Crusader Kings 2. Yes, we have combined roleplay with grand strategy, and these are the reasons why I say that. If you're looking for an engaging grand strategy game, you're not looking for Crusader Kings. If your plan is to paint the map with your glorious color of the country you own, you're still not looking for Crusader Kings 2. If you are looking to conquer the entire world, you're still not wanting Crusader Kings 2. But you could do all of those things in Crusader Kings 2. Um, why would I say there's other games more suited for you? It's because those things are not particularly challenging in Crusader Kings 2. This game really isn't geared around world conquest, but it's a grand strategy game. What do you mean it's not geared around World Conquest? Because Crusader Kings 2 is geared around people. So I am Duke Brian the Fowler of Normandy. Um, Fowler is just a title given to me because I, I'm, I'm a falcon here, basically. I'm going to click on House Rowan. This is my dynasty shield. And we're going to look at my family history since I've started this game. I began as Count Bagolf of Rowan. That's my grandfather, right? That was the first character I played as. A mere Count. And then I played as Duke Sulphur of Normandy. That was my father. And ultimately now, I'm Duke Brian, the father. Now, 
these characters have gone on and they've had families and they've had children. And this, this is what this game is about. This is about the dynasty of the House Rowan. I just happen to be one of the characters within that dynasty. I'm a rather important character, if you will. I am the Duke of Normandy. As you can see, my brother is the Marshal of Normandy, so he's the person that works for me. My other brother is a uh, court chaplain of Anjou and Count of Anjou, which, yeah, fairly important. My sister Elizabeth is, well, she's just, uh, just a person, nothing special. Um, let's see, anyone else? Uh, my nephew here, Tankred is uh, the heir to the county of Anjou, so he's, he's going to be a count someday. Pretty cool. Um, uh, this nephew here is he's the heir to a barony, barony of Cholet, so he's, he's going to be a baron someday. Um, but yeah, um, this is kind of the entire point of Crusader Kings, is to grow your dynasty. If you click here on the Dynasty map mode, you will see dynasties currently that are, well, at the head of their respective uh, countries or empires. So again, I guess you're still thinking, well, don't, don't I want my dynasty to be in a big name? Wouldn't that mean map painting? Shouldn't I be conquering the planet and spreading my dynasty? Yeah, sure. You, you can definitely do that. That is a very, um, a very easy way to spread your dynasty, if you will. Um, but it's not the only way. Um, in fact, I would say that that method of spreading your dynasty is almost... Uh, for lack of better words, easy mode, and kind of lame. And that's why this game is more than just a dynasty simulator and grand strategy game, it is also a role-playing game. So I'm going to unstop the clock here, and I'm let the, gonna let the game go forward. And I'm going to hopefully show you here shortly why the game is considered a role-playing game, and this is the reason. Crusader Kings 2 is a never-ending barrage of these wonderful pop-ups. If you like games that give you storyline pop-ups like this, you're going to love Crusader Kings 2. Now this particular one says, being on your liege's council is not always easy. You have a huge amount of work that needs attention. And there's so much to do. The list seems endless, just as you were about to give up. Duke Burchard II steps through the door and asks if you want any help. As tempting as it may be, you would be in his debt for it. So, Duke Burchard there, he is the steward of France. He is part of the Privy Council of France. Just like I am the Marshal of France, I am also on the Privy Council of France. We are fellow councillors to our king, the King of France. He is offering uh, to help me out, but in exchange, I will owe him a favor. Or I can attempt to say no, I can do it myself, but this could cause me to become stressed a very high chance of me becoming stressed, as well as the Duke there having a negative opinion of me. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go with uh, owing the Duke a favor. Now here I get to read about, I'm pleased to hear that after a period of peace and shrewd management, the county of Amiens, which is this one here, um, is doing very well. People are happy and the tax collectors, tax collectors are reporting record intakes. Amiens prospers.
so yeah, um, one of my, my counties is getting prosperous. So I'm just the duke. I am not the head of my country. I am just a, a mere duke uh, within the kind of butchered country of France, if you will. My Chancellor, Mayor Meinhard, has improved relations with Bishop Rotberg Bovis. Yay! So I have better relations with some random mayor. The county of Amiens is game prosper. Good. And we'll continue to let the time go. Um, right here it says that my my king is currently at war, which means I'm indirectly at war with uh, the king of Austrasia, which are these gray guys here. This guy here is just a host. That's a random, like, pillager viking running around uh, laying siege. And the local local duke here has has called up his liege levies to to kind of kick this guy out. All right, the Franks in the county of Mortain have now adopted enough of the Latin customs that they can no longer be recognized as Germanic. The scholars now call them French. So that means that the French culture has spread to Mortain, this uh, province of mine that belongs to me. And thus I'm getting the pop-up saying, hey, one of my provinces has become French. Thankfully, for me, that means that all of my provinces except for Vexen here have now converted from being Frankish to French, which, yeah, I'm happy about because I'm actually French. So, uh, if I look at like this province here, you'll see that there is a slight uh, revolt revolt issue. Um, different culture group plus two. Uh, however, the the county is prospering and my king had crushed a revolt. So the minimum revolt risk is still zero, but if the king had not crushed a revolt recently, there would be a revolt risk of 1%, uh, because that province that I own is slightly different culture. Though Frankish and French are very similar cultures, the more different the culture, the greater the, the negative. And again, this is this is certainly starting to turn into more of a let's play than a review. So, what type of player? I guess the thing that you must ask yourself is what kind of a of a game player are you? Are you a game player that likes action-packed first-person shooters? If so, Crusader Kings probably is not going to be your cup of tea. However, if you're a person that grew up reading books, well, maybe I'm talking to the wrong generation, but if you ever read a book called a Choose Your Own Adventure book, where uh, you could you could make a choice on a certain page and it would say, turn to page something or another, and you turn to page something or another to continue your story, instead of turning to a different page to continue your story, uh, then maybe you might like Crusader Kings 2. It's got RPG-like elements in that you make choices for your for your person. And your person happens to be the leader of uh, a feudal lord, so you're uh, in proxy making choices for the, the feudal kingdom that you control, or tracts of land. You could just be a count, so you could only be making a choice for a county, or you could be a duke, so you could be making the choice for a duchy, you could be a king, and so on and so forth. So right now, dear Brian, I'd like to invite you to join me for a small gathering of friends to dine, drink, and forget about the world outside of a little, outside for a little while. Please be prepared to reserve a few days for this in case we get truly into the spirits of the proceedings. Duke, Gadalka the second of Flanders. So the Duke of Flanders wants me to come and carouse with him. But you see, the Duke of Flanders, he's 
a smelly Dutch, and us French people. You know, we're more classy than to stoop to associating with Dutch drunkards who are slothful and hedonistic. Not to mention, yeah, not my type of company. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, I just can't make this party. So, if you enjoy making choices like that, for no really great reason whatsoever, then maybe Crusader Kings 2 may be a game that you're interested in. Crusader Kings 2 is a game really for a person, I don't want to say with imagination, but yes, for a person with imagination. If you can get into your character, and you can roleplay your character, and you can learn to play the game within the realm of your character, you might really enjoy the game. But one problem with the game is the is the inherent propensity for people to want to roleplay Genghis Khan or Napoleon or or any other great conqueror of whatever age. You can and go f you can go forth and conquer the world fairly easily. Uh, the game doesn't have a lot of propensity to stop you. Uh, the player can snowball and get out of control without too much of an issue. So I, I just want to point this out. I'm just the Duke of Normandy. I'm, I'm not the king, right? If we look at my, my power, I can call up 4,286 troops, of which are actually my my troops, specifically, not from my vassal, but just for me, myself, and I, 4,100 of those are me. So, well over 90% of my troops are my troops. I'm not having to ask my, my mayors and, and vassals to supply me with troops. I have the troops. So I have, uh, I have a good 4,000 plus troops just at my beck and call without much issue at all. My king, who I am so uh, loyally beholden to, um, he has 6,345 troops, of which about 478 of those troops are his. The other 4,275 he gets from his vassals. I am one of his vassals. So if I were to declare war upon my king or, you know, uh, demand independence from my king, you'd see that uh, my strength vastly outmatches my king. I could very easily win my independence if I so chose to do so. But where's the fun in that? I mean, I, I could easily become king of France right now if I wanted to, but I don't. Because I know a secret about this game. And the secret about this game is the stronger you become, the, the more kingly or the more of an emperor or whatever you might be, the larger tracts of land you own, the more money and more power you have. Yes, you can have a few more vassals, and yes, you have a few more vassals that you need to make happy, but that's not that hard. Uh, people people act like managing a giant empire is, is such a challenging thing, and really it's not if you understand the mechanics of the game. 
you understand the mechanics of Crusader Kings 2, you can easily micromanage uh, an empire that spans the entire world without really breaking a sweat. It, it's rather simple to to uh, to micromanage that type of a situation. Not to mention, it's very rare that all of your vassals are going to revolt at the same time to cause you even any type of, of uh, possible uh, threat to your rule. So what I'm saying is becoming a, the, the great emperor or owner of the entire world it's not really a challenging thing. Um, so the best way to play Crusader Kings 2, and I'm, I'm not saying there's a right way. There's so many different ways to play Crusader Kings 2. You can paint the map if that's your thing. Go right ahead. But if you're a role player, if you're somebody who enjoys creativity and just, and just you know, going with the flow of the game, then you may not want to... You may want to keep your conquering desires in check. You may want to try to be a loyal duke. You might want to try to stay a duke for as long as possible. You, you want to put a check on your power because it's so easy for you as the player to steamroll inside of this game. That the game can be far more interesting when you keep yourself a smaller person. So with that being said, um, th that's, that's just some tips, I guess. Tips and tricks to Crusader Kings 2, if you do decide that this is a game for you. However, this is supposed to be a review video, correct? Um, and I have really not done much in the way of reviewing. So, let's get back to that, shall we? From a grand strategy point of view, Crusader Kings 2 may be the worst grand strategy game inside of the Paradox stables. Um, if you want grand strategy, uh, Europa Universalis 4 is the game to play. Europa 4 is has got such better AI um, such better AI for the purposes of trying to conquer the world and to put checks on you conquering the world. Europa Universalis 4 is a far more interesting game for the person who wants to conquer the world and have some sort of challenge behind it. So, if you're wanting Crusader Kings 2 for a challenging grand strategy game, well, it fails to deliver. If you're wanting Crusader Kings 2 for a hybrid of a roleplay game and a grand strategy game, then this game will deliver. If you're wanting an action-packed game, Crusader Kings 2 is not going to deliver. If you're wanting a game that is going to stretch your imagination, Crusader Kings will deliver. So, ultimately, this is not a game that's for everyone. But is it a good game that's worth its money for the person that it is for? Oh, it is most definitely. If, if you want to consider games as being uh, valued from a price tag to hours played standpoint, this may be the best game I've ever played, as, as I don't know another game that I have a better cost to hour ratio in. Crusader Kings 2 has more game hours for me than, than any other game that's ever existed. I've, I've played no game more than I've played Crusader Kings 2. That's an impressive stat in and of itself. I oftentimes I recommend people when they're looking at Steam reviews to look at how many hours the person has played the game 
when you see all of these negative reviews, has the game been played for five, ten hours? When you see all of these positive reviews, has the game been played for five to ten hours? And then when you find games that are, you know, wildly positive, do are the reviewers that are reviewing giving the positive reviews? Are they in the 50-hour ballpark? Are they in the 100-hour ballpark? The 500-hour ballpark? The thousands of hour ballpark? You're not going to find many games on Steam, like Crusader Kings 2, where the fan base within the game, reviewing the game, is going to have thousands of hours as the normal within those reviews. So when you look at a game and you see so much fan fanboyism with so many hours, you know the game has to be doing something right to keep people playing for that length of time. And clearly, Crusader Kings 2 has done that. Uh, another uh, issue that some people have with with Paradox games in particular, and Crusader Kings 2 is a Paradox game, is the DLC model. So, I understand some people's reservations with the DLC model. Um, I've firsthand seen the DLC model done completely and horribly wrong, uh, especially with EA and like The Sims. But Paradox, Paradox is a, is a company that does the DLC model correctly. And the reason Crusader Kings 2 is, is the game that it is today is because of the DLC model. Um, I own every major DLC that's ever come out for the game. Did I buy them at one time? No. Did I get them when they were on sale? One at a time? Yeah. I always laugh when I read these these uh, criticisms of the game saying, I'm not going to spend $180 for this game. Well, I wouldn't either. Who would? And it seems the, the, common, uh, the common misconception is people believe that they need to get every DLC that the game has straight out of the box. You don't. Especially with Crusader Kings 2, in that you'd have no idea what the DLCs did, or even if you liked them. Because you wouldn't know what the base vanilla game comes with compared to the DLC. And so, I think that's a horrible idea. I think it's a horrible idea to buy Crusader Kings 2 with all of the DLCs straight out of the box. Crusader Kings 2, without any DLCs, is an amazingly awesome game. Um, if there is a DLC that I would say to get straight out of the box, it would be Way of Life. Way of Life is hands down the single greatest DLC that Paradox has ever created, and it enhances any gameplay experience, no matter if you're playing Vikings, Christians, uh, Muslims, uh, Ashkenazi, uh, whoever you're playing as, the Way of Life expansion is our DLC is just, it, it enhances every gameplay. Uh, and the way of life, it mainly gives you more of these pop-ups that I tell you that I like. These, these, these pop-ups that come up on the screen, that's why I play Crusader Kings 2. And you're like, what? You play Crusader Kings 2 for the pop-ups? Surely you've read all the pop-ups uh, a thousand times over. And I'm going to tell you, I have 3,000 plus hours in this game, and I still see new events. Did I just blow your mind? I may have just blown your mind, didn't I? 3,000 plus hours, and I have not seen all of the pop-ups in this game. I am still yet to have a character become an immortal. I know it exists. I know you can do it. I've... You know, I've been lucky to have some of the more rare events happen in my gameplays that, like, uh, becoming a lunatic and, and 
and having Glitterhoof as my chancellor. That's always a fun event. Um, I've been a werewolf. I've, uh, I've given birth to the, 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 the most evil child that ever existed. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of interesting events that have happened. But I'm still yet to become immortal. Um, and there's so many other rare events like that that, well, you have to have a particular bowl of soup in your game for that event to even trigger, and even then it's it's small percentage based. So just because you might have the, the things to trigger it, it still, you know, will only trigger 1% of the time. So Crusader Kings 2 always has new stuff around the corner. Even though I've played it 3,000 hours. And that's one of the things I love about it. No game plays out the same. Uh, every game plays out differently. Uh, the, you know, the world unfolds differently in every match. And that's always interesting to see. Like, in this particular uh, uh, unfolding, we have some rather strong uh, Vikings going on in Denmark and Saxony. Um, this is 848, and we have a lot of Saxon land. Usually the Saxons get crushed uh, uh, long before this. And Denmark is, is much more unison than I've seen typically happening at this point in time. Uh, you've got a Pickland that's starting to control a lot of the main areas of, of the British Isles, which I've seen once or twice, but you know, that's not common either. Um, so it's always interesting to see things just kind of unfold differently. Um, this dynasty here controlling controlling the uh, the Iberian Peninsula, the, the Muslims here, this is not the normal dynasty. Uh, let's see if I can find The Umayyads. These guys here are usually the dynasty that controls this. So this is an interesting change of pace in that a different dynasty is controlling the Iberian Peninsula than normal. Um, in France, we have the Tassongi dynasty controlling or attempting to control France, which is very different than normal as well. That's usually the Carlings that are that are trying to hold this this French issue together. Um, so yeah, things always turn out differently. And that's one of the things I love about Crusader Kings too. It's just seeing how how history is gonna unfold this time and being a small contributor to how that all plays out. Anyway, I think uh, I think you get the idea. Uh, Crusader Kings 2, for the right person, is an excellent game. So I give it two thumbs up if you're something, somebody like me who enjoys a complex, uh, as my friends call it, spreadsheet-oriented game. Um, if you have some imagination and you, in, and you can keep yourself in check, uh, you will enjoy Crusader Kings immensely. However, if you are a grand strategy enthusiast that wants to that wants to control the world, that wants to take over the world, then there's other paradox titles, and I might point out Europa Universalis IV as being the title for you. Maybe you're a grand strategy enthusiast that loves the conquering, but in a more sci-fi atmosphere out in outer space, then you should probably give Stellaris a check because Stellaris is, is a pretty awesome game with, with some pretty cool graphics that takes place out there in outer space. But anyway, this has been James Johnson, and this has been my review of Crusader Kings 2, my longtime favorite game. So as my longtime favorite game, I'm definitely going to give it two thumbs up. But I am definitely a fanboy of this game, so my review is very 
biased. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please leave a like. Um, and as always, peace.